thank you for coming today. And Michael will be talking about achieving massive open source project adoption. All right. All right. Um, okay. So basically, everybody here is going to have a good idea several thousand times in their career, right? So what I'm really talking about here today is not so much like what I did because that's boring, but more so how can you replicate some of those effects? Um, not every idea you have is going to be the best as an open source project. If you can do a .com website and you're going to get people to sign up for a subscription fee or something, that might work better. But what I'm going to show today is one idea. If you want to, say, create the next jQuery or something like that, right? How do you start that idea from nothing and get it really popular? How do you get a lot of people really engaged in that idea? And how do you use that audience, that community, to uh, continue to evolve your idea and make it better and better? So um, obviously, you have to start a project. You, have to, you can't really say, I want to make this thing and have people show up and then start building the thing, right? You're going to have to put in some initial legwork. Um, if a lot of people, I think, are really hungry about startups, like they say, I want to have a startup, and they say, what is uh, a good idea? And they try to come up with something that's going to make some money. Um, my personal advice, if there's any in this presentation, uh, solve a problem you have, something that like, means something to you and you have a lot of experience in, and you'll enjoy it a lot more, because you're about to spend a lot of time with this particular idea. Uh, but projects are more fun when you have users. Like everybody can create something and they can put it on GitHub, and we've seen so many cool things. But uh, usually there's like no README and there's nobody forking the code and nobody knows how to install it. If you just take your code and you throw it over the wall, um, well, that's it's great that you had that experience and maybe you showed one or two friends. But uh, you could actually get a lot more people engaged and a lot of maybe even other people to help out. And this is what um, I'm going to kind of show you how to do. So uh, github.com, for anybody that hasn't uh, kind of got onto this bandwagon, is pretty much critical for open source projects today, right? Uh, hosting it somewhere else or having a tarball in a web server uh, is, is looked on as a very 1990s kind of thing to do. Um, everybody's on GitHub. And the reason that they're all there is because everybody has the same sign-on, the same credentials. Uh, they can comment on the bug tracker on every project. GitHub's bug tracker is absolutely horrible, but the fact that everybody has the same account means that they can actually interact with all these projects. And that's what's important, really, in the end, um, that everybody's already there, that the critical mass is there. Um, but GitHub's really not going to help you get discovered, but it's just kind of uh, the initial requirement. So when you have a project and you want that project to be successful, you kind of have to think about, what's my initial audience, right? So. Um, I was recently talking to an uh, engineering project uh, that Missile was organizing and about, a, about a game project. And you're at college, right? So get people at, at school to play your game, right? So that makes sense. Uh, when I was starting Ansible, um, I knew a lot of people from systems management stuff. So I was already helping people manage data centers in the past. So I had this old mailing list uh, that had like four or 500 people on it. And I knew a lot of people from that, and they knew me. So I could go over here and say, hey, I've got this project you might be interested in. Um, if there's a local meetup group, that can be a great way to start things, and it's really, really low cost. Just show up and present on your topic, right? Once you get a few people interested, that can really steamroll as they tell each other and they tell their friends and so on. Uh, but think about like, how you can get more people exposed to that idea. Um, and when you're building the project, one of the things that you really have to do is focus all the time on the user's first experience with that project. And this is kind of really hard to do, and it's, it's somewhat out of our comfort zone. Um, if you think about there just being code, right? A lot of times when you write code, um, really that code is, is your brain, right? Everybody writes things differently, so you can't just dive into a project. You have to say, how is somebody that's completely foreign to me that doesn't even think how I think, how are they going to interpret this? How are they going to know how to get started, to set it up, to try it out? And the way that we do that is, Mostly, unfortunately, writing some really, really good documentation and good websites. Um, I'm not a Ruby developer by any means, but I've done some web development. And uh, one of the reasons I think a lot of projects in that space, such as Rails, got very popular too, was people were really good about explaining why should I care about this project. And they also were like kind of really good with CSS, right? So everything looked really professional and slick, and they spent time on the presentation of that idea, right? Um, if you just have a readme up on GitHub that says, this is cool, it does foo, um, it's not really enough. 
So like when Ansible was getting started, it was a, it was a nights and weekends thing, right? So I was building this uh, kind of as a proof of concept. I didn't really think it had business value, but I still spent like 40% of my time on documentation and comments and making sure things were easy to understand. Um, but also think about the API, right? So the API of a project is really the language that somebody's first gonna interact with it, right? So yes, methods inside code are black boxes, but the API is, is the language that people are first gonna see. So making that easy to understand and compelling and being able to show like really short code snippets of this is what this does if it's a code thing. Um, if it's a video game, being able to have screenshots, right? Versus, hey, I'm just gonna ask you to go install this giant list of packages before you see what this thing is. Um, presentation matters a lot because you wanna get people hooked early. Um, so I already went through the doc stuff. Code quality actually doesn't matter as much as you think it does. Um, I, now, your professors may think otherwise. Um, I write a lot of code in Python, and the reason I like Python is it has a, it's, for one, it's really easy to write, and it can kind of be a executable prototype that sort of can survive into production and can in, in, into shipping, right? Um, but it's also really good because somebody who's really new to programming, like my audience was a lot of systems administrators or you know, people use the word DevOps now or whatever, IT folks. Um, a lot of those people may have only had bash programming experience, but they could learn Python really easy, right? And that low barrier to entry allowed them to contribute and so on. So um, a lot of my colleagues and myself believe in not being especially clever with your code, but just making it easy to understand, right? So not using maybe the full power of the language, but allowing somebody to dive in but all of it's gonna change constantly later, right? Uh, what is most is, can somebody get started? That's kind of what matters most. So, you've got this project, you've kind of started trying to make it accessible to people, right? You've got this great idea, you want lots of people to care about it, um, but you really wanna make it larger, right? You've taken some of the initial steps, what are the next steps? Um, when you're thinking about a community uh, in open source, um, or not even in open source, it helps to understand what you want that community to be, right? Um, a lot of people can kind of think of community as a buzzword, and it's, it's not, right? It's, uh, these are the people, your users, but how are they gonna interact? Are they just gonna offer ideas or help? Are they gonna help test? Are they gonna help write code? Are they gonna help write documentation or do graphics or generate content? Uh, maybe it's all of those, maybe it's just a few. Um, but you wanna help those people become really engaged because that's where the secret really kicks in. Um, as your community gets really engaged with your product, they take ownership, and they're the ones that are gonna be promoting your idea forward. So, um, back when open source was a little bit more controversial, right, they, we used to talk about the idea of open source being viral with licenses, and that's not exactly true, right? But the idea that um, it spreads, right, is, is important, right? So some of those analogies hold, right? So if you can kind of think of your software in biological terms, right? The way that you get higher evolution in software is you have you know, more genes and more reproduction out there, right? So the more people are trying things out and bouncing things around, and the quicker it is to iterate between one version and the other and try out new ideas, uh, the quicker something's gonna grow and evolve. So community size is, is really key um, because users infect software to other people when they like that software, right? So it's kind of a bad analogy, but it sticks. Um, as you get more users, people are gonna want things. They're gonna want you to do lots and lots of things. Um, and it's important to stick true to some of your original values, right? But also allow some of those outside values to come in. So um, I'll, I'll get, get into more of this later, but it, understand why you created something to begin with and make sure that your original vision still comes through. Uh, and balance that with, here's all these people that want these things and I wanna make them happy so they can become rabid super fans. Um, in case that you weren't aware, uh, lots of things still happen on mailing lists and uh, internet relay chat. Internet relay chat is horribly dated, like most of the cool kids are using Slack at work these days, but there's a tremendous open source community if you're building an open source product that still lives on IRC. Um, the, reason, the one thing that's nice about IRC versus Slack is I can be logged into like 20 or 30 channels at once, right? And they can be all over the place and that, it makes it simple. Um, and mailing lists, because not everybody is in your time zone. Um, as people work in all these different time zones all over the world, you wanna be, uh, allow them to contribute, but also realize that for some people, say English isn't a second language or 
Uh, maybe they're vision impaired and they're using screen readers, or maybe they want to do a web search and find out the answer to something later, and you don't want to have to keep repeating yourself. Um, so you really have to do kind of both of these things, um, and it, it takes a lot of work. Um, I'm going to get to this later, but the idea of launching a project and making it very, very successful is actually much more possible than everybody thinks. It's just a lot more work, right? So I mean, that's a good sign, because if you've got an idea and you want to make it big, uh, the idea like to blow up, right? Um, you can. You just have to go through all the all the steps and put in put in the effort. Um, code to test things, automated tests, very important. Um, I think like state is probably teaching TDD, maybe not, um, but that's really good when you have a lot of outside code contributors to a project. Particularly, I mean, if you're doing something open source, right? People are going to break things, so encouraging. Uh, them to experience development first by writing tests or having tests that prove that their work passes or that a bug was fixed can be super, super valuable because it allows you to move faster and break things more, right? Because you want to try out new ideas. You don't want to be fearful of code. Um, the, when you're actually fearful of code, what happens in the end is that you become afraid of this thing and you, you write some glue around it or you go in and you do the bare minimum. And over time, these fears build up, and it's kind of the source of all bad things in programming. So having a test to say, I don't understand why uh, this guy wrote this this way. I'm just going to throw it out. And being able to know that you can throw it out becomes uh, super important and powerful. And once you get to the point of having like 1,000 contributors, a uh, weak test will hurt you. Um, I, I had that problem myself. right? We didn't have great test coverage in many areas because it did a lot with uh, testing systems with lots of side effects and, you know, network dependencies and uh, all that kind of thing. But um, they're very valuable. Um, so if you want to make an idea really big, uh, one thing that you should also be possibly aware of is meetup.com, right? Um, basically, today, everybody can have a internet meetup anywhere they want for, and organize it for very low cost. Um, for me, uh, the DevOps groups, right, or the, like the IT continuous integration type groups were really big. Because what happens is somebody who likes a project that they've tried out will go share it with their group. right? And then there's 20 more people that know about things. And those people tell their friends at work, and so on. right? Um, all you really have to do there is uh, present. right? So you can kind of start these nice butterfly effect snowballs going with, with your projects if you uh, if you go to the right group. So if you're doing something in JavaScript, go to your local JavaScript UI group. Uh, it's a good way to meet people, maybe find out about job postings and, and things like that too. But uh, definitely look into like, what your local meetup groups are. And there's some really good ones, especially if you're around like uh, here in Raleigh um, as well, or like any major cities or anything like that. But they're also all over the country in places you wouldn't expect. Um, Twitter. Twitter is annoying, but you have to be there. Um, so I spent a lot of time originally starting with my project of like answering misconceptions. So with configuration management, right, um, I decided to basically adjust the management of systems over SSH. And everybody said, this is impossible and wrong because all the programs don't do it this way. And I wanted to prove them wrong. And everybody kept saying, configuration management isn't SSH in a for loop and all these other things or you're all this complicated theory that we invented you're not doing. So, uh, you have to be really nice and correct some of the initial opinions about your thing and provide really good visible customer service, right? Um, and I think you can do that by being you. You don't have to sound all corporate and apologize for things or whatever, but uh, when people see you on Twitter and IRC and the mailing list providing lots of help and service, they're willing to stick with you throughout all the, the weird, comp excuse me, uh, all the weird, complicated, horrible bugs that you're probably going to inflict on them, right? because they know that you're a good person and they've formed a personal relationship with you. Uh, Twitter's annoying because of the 140 character rule. People will say stuff like, foo is broken, and you have absolutely no idea what it means. Uh, like, broken how? Uh, or they'll try to paste like uh, white space significant code inside of 140 characters, and that doesn't work well either. And all these other things. But uh, it's actually a really good resource. Uh, and the tech people kind of use Twitter differently than uh, most normal humans, instead of tweeting pictures of their food, right? It's usually, uh, I found the software package, or they're, you know, talking to people. Um, I don't like it, but on the other hand, it's like th that, along with Meetup.com, has been, you know, super powerful in, in getting the word out. Um, I don't think tech travels on Facebook as much, but that 
I could be wrong. Um, I already mentioned GitHub. Redundant slide. Um, we talked a little bit about readmes. Um, but so you go to a lot of project sites on GitHub and you see like a two line description of what something is. And it's usually something like foo is x for y, right? And that's terrible, right? So just figure out what, how to say to somebody who doesn't understand any of the underlying technology why they should care about your project. Show them a really good code snippet and uh, show them the steps that they would need to do in order to like, become successful with your project because they're really only going to give you about five minutes. Right? They, if they're really interested, they might give you 15 minutes. Um, GitHub allows you to do pull requests. right? It's uh, in a way that everybody does pull requests. It's good and bad. Uh, the reason being, you'll start a project and people just throw code at you to fix things and they won't really ask, is this the way you wanted it fixed? Right? And you'll go back to them and you'll have to, you go out of your way to really communicate, well, that's great, I really appreciate that you've done this. Um, you have some really good ideas here, but I really need it done this way. Can you rework this and send it back? Right? Um, so you have to do a lot of that because GitHub doesn't provide good tools for those kind of things. The issue tracker is really basic. It's getting a little better, but the fact is everybody's there. If you turn off the GitHub issue tracker, basically nobody's going to bother to file bugs. Like, so suppose you have a bug tracker on Redmine or Track or, you know, I don't think anybody uses Track anymore, or whatever. Uh, effectively, you're going to have like a quarter of the less bugs filed because you weren't uh, in the sandbox that everybody's playing in. So um, for massive open source uptake, you, you pretty much have to be on GitHub. Um, when I started things out, I actually did not present Ansible at a conference for an entire year. Uh, six months in, I actually beat the company I was currently working at's web traffic by three times uh, per month. So it was, I was getting uh, tremendous amounts of users. And that's because people spread it for me, which was pretty nice, right? So I said you do have to get out there um, to kind of kick things off. But uh, once, you, once you actually get it going, the internet allows you to not worry about you know, geographic locality nearly as much, which is really cool. Um, I've, some of the countries that are really good for contributing are like in Europe and elsewhere. And they'll share things. And people share things all over the US. And, uh, um, you know, w one of the coolest things that actually happened to me is I woke up one morning and I saw there was like this like two or three hour long live stream about all Ansible things in Japanese and I understood absolutely none of it, but I watched it on YouTube for like a long time. Um, it was just really cool to see that kind of stuff is, is possible and happens and um, like when I was in school and even after I shortly I graduated, right, we didn't really have Google Hangouts so we didn't have as many good uniform ways to communicate. We had some mailing lists. Um, people are a lot more connected now. Uh, no slides on this topic, but the downside of that is people are going to write blogs and hateful things on Twitter all the time, and uh, people advise you not to read the comments. I read all the comments. Um, it probably helped me understand things better to, to deal with it, and I still obsessively, compulsively read like, comments on a project I no longer work on, and I'm unable to not do it, but uh, it's useful. Um, and I, my clicker is dead. That's okay. I, I'm, I think I'm all good without the clicker. Um, so a good friend of mine came up with this idea of like this 15 or 30 minute rule thing, right? So if you have like a, a very technical project, right? So if you, if it's, this, the rules may not be the same if you're talking about a game or something like that, but for something that like business people would use, they're pretty much going to try to run this thing on their lunch hour or when they can steal some time from the boss, right? So they've got 15 or 30 minutes. You have to get them feeling really powerful and successful at the end of that 15 or 30 minutes. So like the install instructions need to be dead on simple. So they can just be like, do this, do this, do this, done. And then have a really, really short tutorial that shows them using your thing to do something successful, right? Um, like if it's a JavaScript thing, hello world, enter this in a text box, you know, this is a calculator, right? Um, getting people hooked in that initial amount of time is huge. The, the competitors that I was originally up against with some of my projects had a much longer install curve where it may have actually taken like three, four, five days to get a, a client server network set up going. And the fact that I could show that I could do that in 20 minutes meant I, I basically won every bake off against uh, that product, right? Because they were so hard to install. And there's so much software, so, so much software that it's, uh, the installation process is neglected so much that um, People want to find other things. So um, you'll, 
the way that everybody thinks connected now, there will be lots of uh, alternatives to everything you do. And then the easier ones to use, as long as they have enough features, have a huge advantage. Um, perfect is the enemy of the good, right? So don't take all your time publishing something. Get a cool idea out there. Get people excited about it. Um, and then that way they can kind of see the pace, right? Um, a lot of times I feel like good projects don't get open source to release because people are afraid of the code. Um, you can release code that's just mostly okay and clean it up later, and everybody's actually going to be fine about that. So don't get really self-conscious. If you've got a good idea, like release it, talk about it, get, get other people interested in it and see where it goes. One of the, the nice things about the open source process, whether it's code, whether it's testing, whether it's content, docs, whatever, is that you're, you're taking users along for the journey and they feel like they're actually part of the project and they are, right? So community is not a buzzword. It's, it's everybody kind of building things together, right? You don't really, the good ideas that you come up with are actually based on conversations you had with somebody over here and a conversation you had with somebody over here and this code and you modified this other idea over here and all these other things. Um, and they add up over time. And when people feel like they're engaged and part of what you're building, they're much more likely to spread it, right? If I've got code in Project XYZ um, and I go to a new job, I'm very much more likely to use Project XYZ. I'm more likely to tell it to my friends, right? Uh, if I knew the developer, right? If I've met, met these guys at a conference. Um, if I felt like I had an idea that contributed to the release. So uh, making everybody feel really welcome is, is super powerful in getting an idea spread. Um, and the other thing you need to do is you need to thank contributors all the time and remember who built what and thank them for it and say, uh, you know, these are the people that contributed to this release and all this other stuff. Because kind of on the internet, most people like to complain about bugs. Not enough people say thank you. Um, and everybody really appreciates that. And that can, that can also go a long way into Because you want these contributors to come back and add more ideas or add more code. And that could definitely happen. Feedback, that's the other big advantage about open source, right? So if you want your idea to be everywhere, right? Suppose you're making this new JavaScript library, or this new IT management cloud widget, right? Um, the advantage that open source gives you over proprietary development is ginormous, right? So uh, I've worked at proprietary companies where the marketing department may have heard some stuff, but you never, you always heard something through a game of telephone, like four layers deep. The ability of an engineer to actually get out and talk to a user is huge, right? Knowing exactly what to build at what time. Um, there's a movement in IT, like with this, I've alluded to the DevOps thing, right? So it's development and IT operations, people talking to each other. Before it was like, we write the code, you get to figure out how to ship it, right? I, I really feel the next big uh, change is going to be engineering and marketing and sales working closer together, right? So we've got to figure out how to make that happen. but. Having the pulse on all the users and knowing exactly what they mean means I build better products, right? And when you get a lot of feedback, one thing that you kind of need to do is kind of figure out what the zeitgeist of everything is and say, these people want these things, these people want this thing, these people want this thing, and then zeroing in and saying, this is a trend and this is where I need to go based on my domain knowledge. Because if there's somebody really loud in the room, right, um, you know, analogies to the current political climate, right? All you hear is that. You don't want to focus on that because you're going to get way off course, right? So um, by having thousands of people contributing bugs and features and ideas and all these other things, you get these really, really good instincts about what's the right thing to do. And there's some ways that you can uh, also augment that, right? Taking advantage of SurveyMonkey, it's free. Sending out an email to your mailing list and saying, hey, which, which things do you think we need to look, work on? Uh, how big is your infrastructure? What's your scaling problems? What's the biggest thing that you want from this release? You can get a lot of really good ideas from, from the crowd that way. Um, OK, so when you have this really, really large development community, um, you want to keep them understanding what's going on. So, Sharing what you're going to do before you do it is good. Sharing this is why we did this is good. Um, rather than giving something that's a black box, right? So if new code just comes out once every three or four months and everybody's like, oh, I was surprised to see what's in here. It's not the same as if everybody feels like they're involved in that process and they have opportunity to comment on it. Um, again, like it's things I learned from Red Hat way back in the day, right? There's a big difference between taking a project and throwing some code over the wall and calling that open source and then actually trying to involve all of your users in building it together. And one of the great things that we're able to do is kind of break down these barriers between companies and get smart people everywhere 
to kind of contribute and figure out what we need to do versus um, one person guessing and then finding out later that they built the wrong thing. So it does feel that software is evolving much, much faster now because we've sort of figured this out and we've sort of allowed these, all these biologic evolutionary factors to influence our applications much, much faster. Um, you're you're going to screw up from time to time, right? You're going to really offend some people. Um, you're going to make colossal errors. You're going to implement something in, in the wrong way that maybe 80% of the users aren't going to like. Um, for one, you have to be able to revi revisit decisions and change and say you're wrong, but also to be able to explain what you did and why. Um, when you come back with like a marketing response to something, and uh, people can detect that, right? One of the great things about software engineers in general is that we're really attuned to logic, and uh, a, a statement that's like improperly propped up will fall down very clearly. Um, so if there's problems, like be able to explain why things happened and, and what you're going to do about them. Um, you see that a lot in like security vulnerability releases, right? This is exactly why this happened. There's the idea in IT operations now of like the blameless postmortem. We're going to figure out why this went wrong and explain it so it doesn't happen again. Uh, so so and so may have made a mistake, but it's not his fault because we all can we all can learn from it. Um, and also in a large open source community, you're going to meet people you don't like. Um, you have to do your best to be civil in all cases, but occasionally like pruning those negative influences and, and you know, banning the occasional troll can make the entire community more productive. So if you see that, like some of the best things to do first is just, you know, trying to agree to disagree, right? So you want to take this in technology direction X, somebody else wants to go in direction Y. Um, going back to some previous slides, explain we're going with X and this is why we're going with X. Um, it's because most of the users want to handle these use cases and if we did Y, it would make it harder to do this other thing or something like that. Um, if you can explain things technically and from this basis, is it's, it's a good thing. And then uh, occasionally projects do have to fork or people take different directions. But one of the ways that you can avoid that in many cases is like having a plugin architecture. So if you disagree with the decision, but you can make it possible to do some of those crazy things in plugins, or they can, they can have some way to enhance it and, and still keep working with the project, that can sometimes be a, a good bridge. Um, so I also, you have a good idea, it's getting really big, right? You may want to say, how can I make some money on this thing, right? Um, perfectly valid. You have to be a little careful about how you commercialize because in open source communities, often they're sometimes a little bit oversensitive to commercial ventures, right? People sometimes think about open source as a religion, but really it's a development methodology, right? So um, finding the right ways to do things, maybe some plugins are proprietary, that can be really good. Um, Maybe you do services and consulting, right? Um, the plugins approach I kind of like a little better just because it, it scales a little bit better from a business perspective. If you can sell a GUI or you can sell some plugins or a feature. Um, but you need to make sure that you continue to support the people that made your project what it is, right? Uh, they're the most important part. Um, so don't think of it as customers being like more important than users or anything like that because it's, the, it's, it's even the free users that help spread things that are infinitely more valuable than somebody uh, paying for something. Um, and, and again, um, as you get more users, your, your project is getting stronger. You're getting better ideas. You're possibly getting code. You're getting testing. You're getting people sharing things. Uh, it's a really great experience to have like a, a project that other people care about and they want to use and that they'll talk about and that gets like, you know, hundreds of Twitter accounts or millions of installs a month or things like that. And it's all possible, but to get there, you just have to apply sort of a methodolo methodolo yeah. careful approach. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's attainable, just, but you do that by thinking about communities and users and people coming in from the outside and what do they feel like and how can I make them get what they want out of this as well as just, uh, just putting some code up there. So um, I hope that gives you some ideas about how to launch some ideas of your own if you've uh, if you've got something and you want to you want to think consider it as an open source project, and even if you're not, hopefully the uh, some of the community building advice is valuable for even if it's a .com application or something that you're going to charge for or you know put up on Steam or something like that. Communities matter and they're they're very powerful if used correctly. So uh, it's kind of the end of the talk. Um, I think we're going to take some questions and be glad to answer any of them. Okay.
If you'd be so kind, if you have a question, if you'll raise your hand, one of our ambassadors will bring a, a mic to you and wait till you get the mic because that'll allow us to capture it for the video. So. I have two questions. How did you answer queries on Twitter? Um, how do you answer queries on Twitter? Um, I don't, it's sometimes tricky. Usually I try to direct them to the mailing list if it's too technical because it's, it's like almost impossible. And especially sometimes uh, if you can direct somebody to documentation, that could be good too because it's like, here's this answer, everybody else can find it and then maybe you've also kind of uh, taught them how to, uh, you know, let me Google that for you and find things, and that can be good. Um, if you answer somebody and they kind of have a, a massive disagreement and they start calling you an idiot, um, that's kind of when I stop, right? It's, it's probably not best to get into a, a giant flame war, but uh, it's tricky. <laughs> Second question, how important is sharing the vision? Yeah, uh, so how important is sharing vision? I think it's really important. Um, so when I started Ansible, I kind of started with the vision and statement of keeping things simple and fast and easy to understand. And that vision kind of guided everything. Um, the, but the first three months were actually kind of hard because I had to get everybody on the same page, right? So uh, everybody didn't really know what it was. And I had to like really communicate what I wanted it to be because if I didn't, the features I would get would be pushing it in a different direction, right? Um, so I think that's key. And then once everybody kind of got the vision and the aesthetic, it was really nice because it had to do a lot less code review. And people kind of knew what it should do and what kind of features it might want to have. And uh, everybody kind of got on the same page. So that's definitely key. Hi. Uh, how long did you spend cultivating initial seed users? Um, how long did I spend? Oh, wow, gosh. Um, so originally, I kind of started things as a nights and weekends project, right? So um, I did a little bit of the initial development for about a week. And then um, the, basically for the first year, um, things kind of went exponential as, as things went, because I, I sort of knew a good initial crowd. But I'd say it's like 40% of my time on documentation and sort of making sure that I, that the, the materials about how to use things were, and the man pages were really good. Um, it's a bit higher than, than what you would think. I, I mean, there's a, definitely a lot of investment there. Um, I was able to launch some things pretty quickly just by knowing, like knowing some of the right audiences and the right people. And I kind of already had like a, a small Twitter following that was of people that might want to try something out. And it, it might be a little harder depending on what you're doing. But I'd say like identify, identify good meetups, good, maybe possibly a conference. Um, the right kind of like online communities or mailing lists. Uh, I, one thing I forgot in the slides entirely, which is super huge, it's hard to get up on there, but Hacker News uh, has really, really good traffic if you can make it on the front page and stay there for a little while. Um, the other thing I forgot were guest blogs. So if you can identify a blog that everybody reads, like for me it was highscalability.com, right? So it's all about the architectures of like Facebook and Google and all these other sites. Um, I just, if you just reach out to somebody and you say, I want to write a guest blog on this topic on my new project. Like half the time, somebody's going to say yes, and that can be a really good way to get, get the word out. Um, yep. Uh, so when you decide to commercialize, uh, doesn't the community get offended because you're trying to make money out of their efforts? Yeah. Um, so. I, Definitely. Um, you have to kind of reassure them that it's all going to be okay. And then while you're doing that, everybody sort of assumes it's not going to be okay. And they have to sort of learn that over time. Um, so for Ansible, what we did is we kept the core of the project always the same and then kind of released a GUI on top, right, that didn't exactly exist in the open source. I just considered starting it. Um, and I think that's reasonable if you tell everyone what the line's going to be and that you're not going to cross it. Uh, there's a lot of projects that do that badly though, right? So you can, I'm not gonna name any names or anything, but if the, there's projects where the company exists and there's like, say there's 100 employees and 80% of them work on closed source things, right? That's bad, right? Because the community kind of realizes that and they can tell. Um, 
there's other ways of doing that. Like if you were to just say, I'm going to do support and services, that's a lot harder because it's you have to have a lot more people. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't scale as well as a business is like selling products. Uh, another good business model that you can do too that most people are fine with is if you can have like a hosted version running in Amazon or Google or whatever, that's like a subscription based or something. And somebody else has, you can install it yourself. A lot of people will pay for you to run that infrastructure so that they don't have to think about it, especially if it's like a, a hard application to manage. But yeah, definitely a tricky one. Um, how different was your final product as compared to your initial vision in terms of probably a user base or architecture? And uh, how much did requirements, refinement go into place during this whole process? Yeah, um, so I kind of started, started the project really simply, right? It was a kind of a proof of concept and it kind of just grew organically from then. And, and pieces would change and morph, but never really got like wholesale replaced. Um, so the, I don't really like some of the agile models of like Scrum and things. They're very heavy and annoying despite not actually being agile. But uh, in a sense, all open source is literally like lowercase agile and that it's always changing and anything subject to change. So it was kind of a continuous evolution. Um, but if you look at what we did in you know, version 0 0.02 compared to you know, version 1.8, you know, like a couple years later, um, I don't think we've changed that much. What we did, we added a lot of plugins and, and things like that. And we kind of added new features to the language in kind of this evolutionary way by kind of listening to everybody all the time. So I'm kind of a big fan of evolving things continuously. Um, different, different projects can work in different ways, definitely. So you were working while you started this project, right? What was your level of commitment? How many um, hours did you put in? Yeah, so the project did start while I was while I added, was work, doing some other work. Um, so it uh, it was kind of usually a nights and weekends thing. It originally started off I was just you know just taking a couple nights a week or three or so and working you know two or three hours. Um, as it went on and I got users, like it kind of feels like for a long time. Uh, Users are going to be the greatest thing ever. When you get users, you're like, oh, no, I wish I didn't have users. Uh, because you have to keep them happy, right? Uh, that's when it got really busy. It started to eat into you know, three or four hours on a Saturday and things like that. And I tried to keep like Sunday free and things like that. Um, but it's, it's attainable. Um, I think like because Ansible was very modular, right? it had all these plugins, we had a tremendous amount of more contributions than um, than a lot of other project models. Like if it was just the core of the library, it wouldn't be so bad. But because there's all these like leaf nodes that don't really touch anything else, like we'd get a, we'd get a fix for Debian over here for this thing or this new uh, module for this thing over here that not a lot of people used. And it would add up over time and make it um, uh, lots of things to go and manage. And then like to go review everybody's code was, was tricky. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot in software is like having multiple contributors and outside committers and for a while, um, we did have some other people helping out. Um, and as we kind of got the company, we were able to hire more people to do that internally. So like, if you can get help, uh, it's, always, it's always a good thing. Like if you can get people to plus one on bugs and test and write a test first so you don't have to do as much code review, that can be good. So do you have some kind of like structured or open source community of some kind? Like some people are assigned to like code review or something along those lines or you're managing vision and things like that? Yeah, um, I don't think there really was too much structure in that. Um, it's sort of clear that when somebody adds a feature, like they're probably the expert on that thing, right? So the, like for like Amazon EC2, a few people came in and they were really, really good with Amazon EC2. And uh, you can kind of go to them if you had questions like, hey, do you have time to work on this? But one of the things that's tricky is open source is about itch scratching, right? So if I don't have that particular itch, you can't really make somebody work on something unless they just really, really love it, right? Because they're most likely trying to fix something that's broke for their day job, or they don't have as much time to work on something as you do. So, um, as, you know, getting people to volunteer to fix things or add features is almost impossible. Um, so you kind of just have to, uh, I, I call it more like creating an architecture of surprise, like making it, the API is really clean and making things modular enough 
so that people can dive in and build something that you didn't expect and you're like, oh, I like that. Because that's what a lot of it's going to be. Uh, you're also going to get a lot of people just, you know, just fixing bugs too. Because uh, like they'll find something and be like, instead of filing this bug report, I just went ahead and fixed it for you. Um, and sometimes you have to work with them to fix the code as well. But yeah, assigning things to open source contributors in my, uh, in my opinion doesn't work. Anybody else? Yep, back. Uh, just curious, what's the most number of branches you've had to deal with on an open source project? Most number of branches. Um, it's not that bad, right? So usually I'll just try to have um, a development branch and then maintaining dot, uh, uh, one dot release on a stable. So the idea that something's already out there and you want to kind of make it quality and fix some of the major bugs that you've released, but that you're doing most of the work on trunk and, and keeping that moving. So I try to keep that small just because I didn't want to be managing a lot of different releases. I mean, there are some people that, you know, like the kernel, for instance, that maintains a lot of, uh, a lot of different trees, and that's kind of why Git was invented, right, is it got really complicated, but um, not a whole lot. Yep. Hi. Um, so Chromium, which was held as this sort of a golden standard for having a open source free private browser. Um, a year ago had a security issue where on startup there would be um, an automatic voice recognition um, enabled. Yeah. Um, so how do you prevent sort of malicious intents or malicious um, programmers from messing with your open source project? Yeah, it's, it's really, really hard, right? So a lot of things are based on trust, right? Um, a reasonable degree of skepticism is, is useful, right? To, if you, I don't know what this code does. Like we had some features that were very obviously cryptography, but in some areas I avoided writing cryptography stuff and I just used standard libraries where I could because I knew I wasn't smart enough to deal with that. Um, but it's, it is all really based around trust. So you have to trust the contributors that are adding things. And, and small things can still get in, right? So bugs and things like a parsing library that can allow user interjection, injection that are you know, not malicious, just accidental, are very easy, right? So you have to you know, publish a CVE report and say, this is a bug. We screwed up. Here's how you update. Um, to be honest, it's, it's, you, have to, you have to do code review, but it theoretically isn't always going to catch everything. So yeah, that's a tricky one. I guess I saw one more in the back. Maybe not. Oh. Hello. I'm curious. Is intellectual property a concern at all? Um, retro what now? Intellectual property. Is intellectual property a concern at all? Um, yes, absolutely. So. Um, there's various ways you can do that, right? So for one, choose a good license that, and there's many, many good options, whether that's MIT or GPL or you know, Apache, right? Whatever you want. Um, I would probably recommend Apache for most projects. I actually did manage to you know, sell a GPL v3 software product to a company, which is great, but a lot of, there's, uh, that license has a slight uh, more uh, complexity with certain lawyers that are afraid of it. Um, that helps a little bit, but what you need to do is you need to make sure that when people are contributing, they at least are saying that I have rights for what I am contributing to you because you're taking their code, right? So if somebody accidentally sends you some patented thing that they're not supposed to send you, um, realistically, there's not a lot you can do, but hopefully you have at least posted somewhere on your website that by submitting code that they agree. Um, there are various... Uh, projects that have more serious contributor licensing agreements where they kind of have to sign something that looks like a contract and there's even some websites that can help with that. Um, I haven't been a big fan just because it's an extra barrier to contribute code and one of the other things is a lot of times people will ask you to sign over copyright. So what that, if people sign over copyright, one of the things that allows you as the maintainer of a project to do is relicense it under another license that could be uh, potentially proprietary. So what I chose to do was not require a copyright assignment sort of as a way to lock in license and give everybody that, uh, that trust that that license wasn't going to change. 
But if you're ever going to actually sell it, that may be something that you do need to think about is, do I have the ability to relicense this? Um, because what you'd have to do is you'd have to go out to all those contributors again and ask nicely. And somebody you might not be able to get a hold of, and maybe that's OK. But somebody might say no, and then you might have to rewrite all of this software. I want to ask a follow-up question to the security one. Once the open source project becomes big and a lot of enterprises are using it, isn't, do you not have to be very cautious because the consequences are very high? Yeah, um, so as, as you get more users on a project, you do have higher risk, right? So like <laughs> the ultimate example of that is probably like a Linux distribution, right? If you allow somebody uh, to arbitrarily contribute code to a C library that everything uses, uh, that, could be, that could be dangerous. Um, I think that just requires commitment on the contributor to understand how a software is being used and to do really good code review and to, uh, most importantly, test code before you just merge it in. So GitHub has this thing called like the merge button, right? Never press the merge button, ever, right? Because what that means is I just merged this code, but I've never tested it. Right? Or maybe the other guys tested it, but you're taking his word for it. Right? Um, make sure that you, your patches are small um, or that they're grouped into small commits and you can look at each one and say, that's reasonable, that's reasonable, that's reasonable. Um, but if you accidentally release something that's insecure, uh, you do have a liability and or at least a, uh, you, you, something that you should do right, to go in and, and fix that. So, if we ever figure out that there's something's insecure, like we pretty much stopped work on anything and go fix that particular security bug as soon as possible, and then you know practice responsible disclosure, which anybody who wants to look up responsible disclosure can do, and you know um, make sure that everybody has a time to update it, and you just don't you know drop that code over the wall. Okay, but this would be the context. This would be the point of view of a contributor, but as a manager of the project. Mm -hmm. What, what would a person who is managing the project do to ensure that there's security? Yeah, um, code review helps, right? If you think you're doing something with cryptography, having a s consultant to look at it is a, a pretty good idea. Um, testing is a good idea. Having you know automated testing QA, those, those are kind of all you can do. Um, open source projects are kind of expected to move fast, but um, you need, it's really up to the gatekeepers of who's controlling what code goes in to make sure they're comfortable with it. Okay. All right, really good questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you.